Lords and Ladies is perhaps the darkest Discworld novel. But Terry Pratchett never went full grimdark with the Discworld series, a fact we fans surely appreciate, but he wasn't afraid to touch on some pretty grim or dark subjects. And in Lords and Ladies, Terry Pratchett touches on the subject of elves. No, not the angelic creatures of Tolkien or the sanitized fairies of Victorian England, but the original elves. The people of the mounds who haunted the British Isles before anglified notions of civilization swept them into the shadows. To quote the book itself, Elves are wonderful. They provoke wonder. Elves are marvelous. They cause marvels. Elves are fantastic. They create fantasies. Elves are glamorous. They project glamour. Elves are enchanting. They weave enchantment. Elves are terrific. They beget terror. The thing about words is that meanings can twist just like a snake. And if you want to find snakes, look for them behind words that have changed their meaning. No one ever said elves are nice. Elves are bad. Yeah. You, you know this one is going to be good. What is Lords and Ladies? Having just returned from her trip to Genua, Margaret is surprised to find her boyfriend, King Verence, making preparations for their wedding. A wedding she never knew about. I, I mean, if Verence is going to go to all the trouble of setting one up, I mean, sh she won't say no, but, but this is still something of a surprise. Even more of a surprise, though, is this new batch of young witches who set up shop while Granny, Nanny, and Magrat were away. They're convinced that witches like Granny are old hat, and a new generation should take things from here. Granny is suspicious, though, especially since the sudden cropping up of crop circles indicates that the circle time is upon the land, a time when parallel universes converge and bleed into each other. This is something of a problem because it provides a perfect time for one particular parasite universe to make its way to the Discworld, a world whose inhabitants the people of Lonker dare not speak aloud, referring to them only as the Lords and Ladies. How does the world of Lords and Ladies work? While elves had been briefly mentioned in earlier Discworld books, this is where their characterization is finalized for the series. Spoilers, it's fucking terrifying. The thing is, critical reappraisals of elves are not uncommon in fantasy, the elves of Andrei Sapkowski being a good example, but in such cases these portrayals are placing themselves in opposition to the image of elves espoused by Tolkien. With Lords and Ladies, Pratchett does with elves what he'd previously done with witches, ignoring the image shaped by pop culture and going straight to the historical source, in this case the fair folk of olden legend. Elves in the Discworld inhabit the parallel, or rather parasite, dimension of Fairyland, where time doesn't quite flow the same and nothing ever grows or changes. The Elves want to come back to the Discworld though because they love to kill and torture things, and the Discworld is full of prey for them to play with. Elves are entirely egocentric, bordering on solipsistic, with no empathy for anything outside themselves and their own amusement. And while iron can harm them, uh, elves can see magnetic lines, so iron messes with their senses. They're still very difficult to kill. Thankfully, there are internal disputes and divisions with the elves, which savvy humans can exploit to save the Discworld. While many elves live in Fairyland under the rule of the Elf Queen, others live in another parasite dimension with the Elf King. Neither have much love for humanity, but each can be persuaded to screw over whatever plans the other one has, simply because they don't get along that well. Similar to Reaper Man, Pratchett uses an excellent balance of moods to enrich the reading experience. However, while Reaper Man mixes moments of humor with moments of somberness, Lords and Ladies takes humor and twists it into horror. The elves are scary not because of any gruesome physical features or corrupting influence on humans, but because their sense of humor is so warped and alien that it's incomprehensible to us. Elves like to kill and torture because it's funny to them. Because living beings are toys to them that they like to break. And Pratchett is now skilled enough at writing humor that he can twist his usual jokes and whimsy into an alien terror. This book is also the first to establish the relationship between Granny Weatherwax and Mustrum Ridcully. 
Back when they were but young whippersnappers, the two actually courted, but Granny gave the romance up when she committed herself to becoming a witch. What's interesting about this is that, unlike wizards, witches in the Discworld are not required to remain celibate. Nanny Og has, after all, had several husbands and several more children over the years. And as Ritkali points out when he tries to rekindle the romance, he was willing to give up his future as a wizard to be with Granny. But even if it wasn't necessary, Granny willingly gave up her romance with Ritkali so as to harden her heart and make herself a better witch. This leads to the question, what does lords and ladies have to say? Magret and her relationship to Granny and Nanny take center stage in this book. Just as in Witches Abroad, Granny takes an antagonistic, tough love approach to training Magrat. But in this book, Magrat finally breaks and storms away from the coven at the start of the story. Granny wastes no time in repossessing all of Magrat's witch things. Upon discovering a letter written by Granny Tavarens, Magrat's anger reaches a fever pitch, and it all rather makes Granny seem like an outright bully. But then, as the circle time comes to longer and Granny is unwillingly visited by parallel timelines where her life took a different path, we start to get a better understanding of her upbringing and perspective. Granny is someone who thrives in adversity. If you bite her, she'll bite you back, and make sure that her jaws sink in twice as deeply as yours. Her own teacher, Nanny Gripes, refused to take her as an apprentice until Granny had camped out in front of her house for a full week. And now, Granny makes constant appeals to tradition and the good old ways. This is why she scoffs at Magrat's New Age mysticism and chides her whenever she suggests something that deviates from how witching ought to be, at least according to Granny. She keeps knowledge of the elves away from Magrat for fear that she won't understand the full danger. She mocks Magrat when it turns out that the armor she used to channel an ancient warrior queen was really just some junk and crockery. And she constantly berates, bullies, and belittles Magrat so that she will bite back. When it turns out that Varence is moving forward with the wedding because Granny explicitly told him to, Magrat is livid. But by the end, as Nanny explains, it was all for Magrat's own good. If Granny hadn't intervened, then Magrat would have hemmed and hawed and not made any decision on her relationship. Thanks to Granny though, Magrat has now learned to stand up for herself and bite back. Except, that's not actually what happens. At all. Granny's decision to keep Magret in the dark actually hurts her instead of helping her, and almost dooms everyone in Lonker. The legend behind the armor may be fake, but the armor itself helps Magret fight the elves, and believing in the legend gives her the courage to save the day. And the plan with the letter doesn't work because of Magret standing up and biting back, but because of her withering and going along with what other people tell her to do. You know, the exact thing that Granny wants to beat out of Magret. Magret does not react to adversity in the same way that Granny does. Instead of biting back, Magret withers when intimidated. The training tactics that made Granny the best which she could be simply do not work with Magret because Magret is different from Granny. Her motivations, personality, and interests are all wildly different from Granny's, so it may seem obvious that she would need a different set of stimuli to bring out her full potential. But Granny is insistent that this is how things have always been done, and therefore they're how they must remain. Here's the thing though, she's not really right. Magret actually saves the day precisely by doing what Granny wouldn't. And while Granny scoffs when the new coven of young witches accuses her generation of stagnation in the witching field, she actually can't beat their challenge to a duel without cheating. The reading I got from all this, then, was that what works for one person won't necessarily work for another. And it's our inability to understand this that leads to the mistakes we make as parents, guardians, and teachers. Granny does what she does for Magret's own good, but all it really does is leave Magret with anger and resentment. Magret can't be taught the same way Granny was taught because she's a fundamentally different person with a fundamentally different background. And it's all strangely reminiscent of a certain cultural axiom that's still in circulation today. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. This is a quote that gets tossed around a lot on the internet, but if you're not familiar with it, it basically just means that the children of successful, prosperous people are often not as successful or prosperous because, since they did not have to go through the same hardships as their parents, 
they are softer, weaker, and lazier than their parents. Here's the thing, though, it's not really true. For a deeper, more nuanced explanation of this idea's flaws, check out the Fremen Mirage article I've linked in the description, but for the purposes of this video, the essential mistake of this axiom is that it assumes that the key to success is hardship. Our parents became successful after facing hardship, therefore it was the hardship that made them successful. They wouldn't have reached their full potential if they hadn't been thrown into the deep end of the pool and forced to swim on their own. The idea then is that, in order for the next generation to be as prosperous as the previous one, the hardships faced by the previous generation must be recreated as closely as possible. But you can't recreate the same hardships as previous generations precisely because such hardships were overcome. New generations have to face new hardships and new struggles, and the key to success for them is not in recreating what worked for the old generation, but what will work for the new one. Even in times of prosperity, there is the struggle to maintain and administer that prosperity, and that takes a different skill set than bringing that prosperity about in the first place. Lords and Ladies, then, is the story of Magret coming into her own potential by following her own path, and it is also the story of Granny realizing that she was wrong, and learning to be better, acknowledging that there are still things she needs to learn. She is, of course, far too stubborn to ever apologize for herself, but in their last scene together when Magret calls her out on something, Granny doesn't double down, something unthinkable up till then. And in her final conversation with Ritkali, she even lets slip this little acknowledgement. That's the thing about the future. It could turn out to be anything. And everything. She picked up a pebble. It hit the water at the same time as one of Ritkali's own, making a double plunk. Do you think, said Ritkali, that somewhere it all went right? Yes, here! Granny softened at the side of his sagging shoulders. But there, too, she said. What? I mean that somewhere, Master and Red Cully married Esmeralda Weatherwax, and they lived... Granny gritted her teeth. Lived happily ever after. More or less. As much as anyone does. Granny and Magret may not get along, but they understand each other now and they recognize that they aren't better or worse than each other, just different. They're different people with different lives, skills, and triumphs. And after two books of bickering and bullying, they finally reach an understanding in this story. Final Verdict In Lords and Ladies, Pratchett showcases a masterful balance of humor and horror. This balance is what makes Discworld so timeless and beloved, and what elevates the book to a 10 out of 10. More than that, though, while many people point to Witches Abroad as the point where Granny Witherwax became the witch we all know and love, I think Lords and Ladies illustrates how trying to pin down a single book for the definite Granny is flawed in and of itself. Granny was always changing and growing, and the beauty of Lords and Ladies is in how it showcases this change and growth. Sure, there are characteristics of hers that remain constant throughout the series, but as we'll see when we look at her future adventures, Granny Weatherwax still had some things to learn. So, for now, I'm Marco King, signing off, and I hope you liked this video. If you did, and you'd like to see me make more, please leave a like or comment down below, share my video via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or the means, and subscribe to my channel. But thank you all, and I will see you in the next one.